The financial needs of a business go beyond tax and attest services. That's why CTBK goes beyond accounting services and offers outsourced solutions through their affiliation with CFO Solutions Plus. These additional services allow clients to focus on their operational and long-term strategic goals. Trust CTBK's outsourced solutions to provide cost-effective, value-added financial services tailored to your company's needs. Call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400. Or go to ctbk.com to learn more about CTBK's outsourced solutions. Welcome to another edition of Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. I'm Tim Graham of The Athletic, here with Jonah Bronstein of the New Bronstein Times. And uh, we have just a bunch of things to get to today, some topics that uh, Jonah and I are, are going to knock around, uh, do some riffing, which is generally what we do on this podcast anyway. Um, notable today, or at least I find it somewhat interesting. A couple of former Bills announced their retirements today. Frank Gore, the brief running back. And of course, franchise legend Ryan Fitzpatrick, the popular quarterback who most recently was shirtless at a Bills playoff game, even while he was employed by another NFL team, which I found to be uh, pretty cool. Uh, just a quirky thing. He was texting Jerry Sullivan in the press box um, during was the that, game, telling him to hey, take a sign? look. I think that was our first sign that he at least mentally was easing into retirement. Maybe, but he's also the kind of guy that I wouldn't be surprised, you know, had he just continued to keep playing. But he was at the time an, an NFL. He was the property of Washington football team. And he's at the Bills game with his family uh, cheering on the Bills uh, in the playoffs. So uh, I guess maybe looking back, it was maybe a sign. Uh, you started pulling those athletic caps over your head when you were still property of the Buffalo News, I think. That's how that goes. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. My, I have such a big melon. Uh, the, the swag that comes from uh, the athletic, I should say the headwear anyway, uh, doesn't fit me. It ends up uh, my kids uh, can have it if they so choose, but and they generally well, don't. That reminds but, me of an issue because I also have a big head and hats that don't fit over my head. And then if you see somebody, a friend of yours who has a small head, is it impolite to be like, hey, I got a hat that'll fit you perfectly? Because I feel bad about that. I'm not going to name any names, but. No, I don't think it, it's uh, it's an insult to them. It's You're being self-deprecating by saying that your head's too too big. My head's too big for the one size fits all hats. I bought a couple off the shelf where they have, you know, the stretchy material. And I think it says one size fits all. I'm not even going to try it on. And then I get it home and it is skin tight. So I need to get uh, whatever. I get fitted hats uh, a lot of times or, you know, the adjustable in the back. That helps. But a lot of times hats don't look right on my head. I'm also a visor guy. I've been told that that is an unbecoming look uh, is the visor. But I have a thick head of hair, number one. Uh, I sweat easily. I need a little ventilation up there. So I go with the visor. I want to keep the sun out of my eyes. I don't want to get sunburnt. So visor is my, is my option. But I, I, I think a lot of people are anti-visor out there. I'm learning. I don't know why somebody would be anti-visor. I think as they look weird. They look normal on a golf course. They do. They do. On an on a NFL sideline. You see a lot of visors, coaching staff wears the visors, or even players sometimes. They come out, and rather than put the ball cap on, occasionally you'll see a player with a visor. Um, Ryan Fitzpatrick, let's get back to him. I want to I talk in general about halls of fame and walls of fame. Let's throw Frank Gore in this conversation, too, even if it's just a brief one. Uh, Frank Gore retired today as a 49er, and it was announced that the 49ers are going to put him in the team hall of fame. Uh, even though he never led the NFL in any category, but he played for so long that he finished third all time in the NFL in rushing, um, seems to be headed to the Hall of Fame. But did he ever really feel like a Hall of Famer when you were watching him? I would say yes. I do think 
Frank Gore is a Hall of Famer. I think he felt like a future Hall of Famer when he was playing one of his last seasons in Buffalo. I don't know if Frank Gore ever felt like the best running back in the league or one of the best running backs in the league. He was up there in terms of production and on your fantasy team, but it was always there were always other players that were either more exciting or more productive or considered better at the time. But I think he absolutely is a player that will end up in the Hall of Fame. He was on the Pro Football Hall of Fame's all-decade team for the 2010s. I would assume most every player that makes one of those teams, although I think Cornelius Bennett is on one of those teams for the 90s or the 80s and did not is not a Hall of Famer. But I'm not a Hall of Fame snob. I think when there's a player, especially a player who's third all-time in rushing, that has a Hall of Fame case, I think they're a Hall of Famer. And I think players that it's not a discussion for – aren't Hall of Famers, and that's maybe where you draw the line. Ryan Fitzpatrick is not a Hall of Famer, and no one would ever really try to make that case. And if you can make a case for Frank Gore, maybe he's not a first ballot guy. Maybe it takes a little bit of uh, convincing from whoever has to do that. You know about that process better than I do. But I do think eventually Frank Gore will get in. Frank Gore, five-time Pro Bowler. His career started in 2005. His most recent season was 2020 with the New York Jets. In that season with the Bills, that is when he surpassed um, – oh, shoot. Uh, who did he surpass? Who did he get past to get into third all time? Uh, he's behind only Emmett Smith and Walter Payton. Um, oh, Barry Sanders. Uh, Barry Sanders is now fourth behind uh, Frank Gore. Uh, and those three guys, obvious Hall of Famers. Uh, but at the time that uh, Frank Gore did get past – uh, Barry Sanders, I reached out to a bunch of Hall of Fame running backs for the athletic, and they all said that he's a Hall of Famer. Uh, the people that I talked to were OJ Simpson, Terrell Davis, Eric Dickerson, Floyd Little. And I also interviewed uh, Walter Payton's son, Jarrett Payton, who coincidentally played with Frank Gore in the same backfield with the uh, with the Miami Hurricanes. Uh, and all of these guys, you know, said, yep, he's heading into the Hall of Fame. Bring it. Uh, we're, we're welcoming him uh, with open arms. There wasn't any kind of talk about, eh, I don't know. Like sometimes you do get some, some hall of famers who, who like to be a little uh, tough uh, because they're in it and they don't necessarily want uh, every, a bunch of others in, but they all seem to like Frank Gore as a hall of famer. You know, one thing, not even seem to they stated for the record that yes he's a hall of famer even though he never led the nfl in rushing and and also never was a first team all pro and i'm looking at this list i don't know if this is every hall of famer but it's kind of ranked by a certain metric that pro football reference does for hall of fame eligibility and he's looking like the only hall of fame every other running back that's in the hall of fame at least once made the all pro team so if that's a line of demarcation uh you know ricky waters didn't make an all pro team he's not in Fred Taylor never made an all-pro team. He's not in. So does Frank Gore, Eddie George, does he fall into that class, maybe with more longevity? Well, he's got – yeah, I think really what gets him in are the numbers, the raw numbers. Yeah, the fact that he played 16 NFL seasons uh, and he ranks third all-time in rushing. I think that's probably enough, uh, even though he didn't have any one necessarily boffo season. He had nine 1,000-yard seasons. Um, he is on that hall of fame, uh, the, the pro football hall of fame's all decade, uh, team of the 2010s, those, that those accolades do matter in the voting room, uh, with the pro football hall of fame, uh, selection committee. Although a, a story was just recently written by Clark judge, who is a, is a selector, uh, that the, uh, the all decade teams shouldn't matter. Uh, because uh, there's only a couple of slots on there. I guess it's similar to uh, earning an all-pro honor for a season. There's not enough room for a lot of great players to necessarily appear on an, all, uh, on an all-decade team. And just because you haven't appeared on one, they, they feel that it has been um, uh, a hurdle for some people to get over that they've not been on one. So the fact that Frank Gore has been on one obviously is in his favor also. I just want to take a look here at his touchdowns. Uh, He had only one season of double-digit touchdowns. That was 2009. He scored uh, 13, uh, 10 uh, on the ground, uh, three through the air. 
Uh, not a huge threat as a receiving back, um, especially uh, later in his career. Uh, never really had uh, much glory in terms of the postseason. Um, but I guess that's enough on Frank Gore. The guy played one season for the Buffalo Bills. Interesting uh, case to, to talk about. Let's talk about Ryan Fitzpatrick in another way. I want to ask you real quick. Oh, before sure. Get there, because another player, former Buffalo Bill, who's retired. So I'm looking at this list and Frank Gore on the Pro Football Hall of Fame probability monitor. He's right there with all of the Hall of Famers. He's 11th all time. The only guy ahead of him that's not in the Hall of Fame is Adrian Peterson, who will get in. Then there's a name down the list that's not in. That's a recent retiree, uh, two all pros, six times in the Pro Bowl. So better than Frank Gore um, and recently retired. Would you say LaShawn McCoy is a Hall of Famer? Well, that is another interesting case. I think he probably isn't. Um, now, it was important for LaShawn McCoy to hit a couple of statistical barriers, and it's one of the reasons he kept playing for as long as he did. Uh, I think that um, you know he had it uh, in his mind, and rightfully so, that he needed to reach 12,000 career rushing yards because that is a line that seems to get you in. Uh, he finished with only 11,102. Um, he did have those Bafo seasons. He did lead the NFL in rushing uh, in 2013. Uh, he led the NFL in touchdowns in 2011. He had 20 of them, 17 rushing, three receiving. He led the NFL in yards from scrimmage one year. Um, but he didn't play as long, didn't have that explosiveness and that ability to cut back and, and we started seeing it his last couple of seasons with the Bills. Um, you know, a lot of tackles for losses, getting getting thrown down behind the line of scrimmage. And then his, his time in Kansas City and Tampa didn't really pan out uh, for much more. And that, that was him trying to hang on and, and get to those magical statistical numbers. But he also is on the all-decade team of the 2010s right there with Frank Gore. Uh, he does have two all-pros, like you said. He has more Pro Bowls than Frank Gore. Uh, the thing about LaShawn McCoy, too, is that you take a and, it, and this also goes in Frank Gore's uh, favor, too. It's to his credit. If we are going to knock receivers, guys like Keenan McCardell, that's just a name that comes to mind. Uh, there are a lot of receivers who finished with big numbers. Um, hell, you know, the, the one that I always like to bring up is, uh, you know, Steve Largent, when he retired from the NFL, was the, was the all-time leader in receptions. Well, Larry Centers, a fullback, finished with more career receptions than Steve Largent. Uh, so that, that, those numbers have just been really distorted, and you have a lot of guys who, uh, uh, you know, Andre Reid, his case for the Hall of Fame was hurt because there were just, you know, re receptions come cheap uh, these days. But if receptions come cheap, then shouldn't you, as time goes on, get more credit for what you've done as a running back in your production there because you are still or were able to produce at a time when the NFL was increasingly going more towards um, a passing game? And if if LaShawn McCoy was a weapon for eight NFL seasons, uh, a dangerous player, um, I, I don't know, I'm going maybe even 10 seasons. Um how much more of an impact did he have with his teams as a dangerous player uh, than Frank Gore did? You know, the fact that he didn't play as long is going to is going to hurt him, of course. But that's a great point you make, uh, Jonah, with uh, with LaShawn McCoy. What are, what are your thoughts on him as a Hall of Famer? I think he's close. I, I, I would probably put Frank Gore in first, maybe from a longevity standpoint and the totality of his numbers. But LaShawn McCoy was a star player in the league for a good eight, nine, 10 years. Um, I'd have to break it down a little bit. His teams never had great success. Even though Frank Gordon won a championship, I think Frank Gore played in one or two Super Bowls. So he had a little bit more team success and was on more great teams than LaShawn McCoy was. But as I said earlier, I think when you start making comparisons from one player to Hall of Fame players and talking about whether they belong in the Hall of Fame, then I think I think by definition, there are famous players that belong in the Hall of Fame. I don't know where you draw the line, and I'm a bit more liberal, maybe because I'm used to the Basketball Hall of Fame, which tends to let everybody in and, and includes college and international, and I know the Pro Football Hall of Fame does not do that. Um, but I would say eventually I would probably expect both of these players to be in the Hall of Fame. One thing I don't expect, I'm wondering what you think, is LaShawn McCoy, if this continues, a Buffalo Bills Wall of Famer. Did he do enough in three 
years as a Buffalo Bill, four years as a Buffalo Bill during that distinction? Well, it's during the, the drought era. Uh, how many players do you put on the Wall of Fame from the drought era? There's going to be, obviously, uh, you know, fan favorites uh, like Fred Jackson, Eric Wood. And I'm not saying they necessarily go up there, but you're going to hear a lot of fans are, would, would like to see them up there. Um, you know, Brian Mormon, even, you know, if a punter can be in the hall of fame, can't a punter be on the wall of fame? And he Fred was an all pro and, and one of the best in the game for a long time. Fred Jackson, who has much less of a hall of fame case, probably has a better wall of fame case. Absolutely. Kyle player. Williams. Um, you know, there, there are some players, uh, um, and I'm, you know, I'm just trying to, you know, catalog through, through my brain here. Um, you know, Stevie Johnson, three consecutive thousand yard seasons for the first time in, in team history. I just don't think all those guys make it. And LaShawn McCoy, he kind of was passing through, even though he had some good seasons, there really isn't a lot of affinity from bills fans. I, I don't think towards LaShawn McCoy, uh, it was a great trade for the bills fell in their lap when uh, chip Kelly wanted to move on from LaShawn McCoy in Philadelphia. Uh, LaShawn McCoy had his off the field issues, making the headlines there. Um, you know, it's um, yeah. I just don't think that there's that warm embrace. Does he, does he deserve it though? Maybe. Um, I just want to make this quick point. Cause I mentioned this about receptions. Steve Largent retired in 1989 uh, with 819 receptions. That was all time in NFL history. He's now 31st. Here's some of the names that have more receptions than Steve Largent, who will never be in the hall of fame. Larry centers, Rod Smith, Irving Fryer, Musin Muhammad, Jimmy Smith, Keenan McArdell. Um, you even have, you know, Anquan Bolden, ninth overall. Uh, does Anquan Bolden, a top 10 receiver, according to statistics at least, all tight? Is Anquan Bolden a Hall of Famer? Um, you know, it's it, <laughs> Anquan Bolden, right? Another former Bill uh, for about five days or whatever it was. Uh, but speaking of the Wall of Fame, what, what, what are your thoughts? And I, I, I purposely excluded this name when I was going through my mind of, of drought era bills on the Wall of Fame. We're talking about these two guys today. What about Ryan Fitzpatrick as a Wall of Famer? Yes, as a Wall of Famer, yes. You think so? Yeah, I think what he represented in that 2011 season and that era, even though it was the drought, it was sort of a spring of hope within the drought and it was a fun era. And the way he embraced being a Buffalo Bill at the time and later coming back for that playoff game, the things that he said, how many Bills fans I think wanted him to come back and be a backup quarterback at the end of his career. Um, I think, yes, I, I think Ryan Fitzpatrick will go down as one of the beloved former Buffalo Bills. There's a lot of other players I might say should belong on that wall first, but I think eventually you get to Ryan Fitzpatrick because it'll be a very fun day at the stadium when Ryan Fitzpatrick is taking his shirt off to celebrate yeah. the Wall of Fame. <laughs> All right, so I guess I'll ask this question too, because Ryan Fitzpatrick, it's certainly not a statistical achievement for him in terms of the, the wall of fame. If you take a look at his numbers, clearly there are other quarterbacks, even in Bill's history, that you would maybe put ahead of him um, in terms of productivity. He led the NFL in interceptions one of his seasons as uh, the Bill's uh, quarterback, uh, 23 touchdowns, 24, 24 Um Never had 4,000 yards receiving, topped out at 38-32 uh, the year that he threw 23 interceptions. Um, he threw an interception on on uh, four four percent of his uh, his passes were were an interception. Uh, um, but he's there as a as a feel, you know. It's like a, the vibe. he's a vibe. Yeah. Uh, if he doesn't take off his shirt at the Bills playoff game, do you still think uh, he's uh, he's a Wall of Famer, or did that moment in Bills history uh, cement his uh, cement that idea for you that he deserves to be on the Wall of Fame? It's probably the visual image that puts him in. I might have made the case <laughs> that he belongs in before that, but that's the centerpiece art when you're putting together the Ryan Fitzpatrick Wall of Fame story. I think that was the moment that it really came to not fruition, but conclusion that he, he was at all of these different franchises and bounced around the league and had various degrees of success. And he's not a player that's solely a Buffalo bill. And much like LaShawn McCoy, he was only here about four seasons. It's not a long bills career, 
But if, if he were to go in the Hall of Fame, I think he would wear a Bills jersey into the Hall of Fame. That was the peak of his career and the peak of who Ryan Fitzpatrick is as an NFL quarterback. It, it started here, and it, I think in, in our memories will go on as, you know, he was a beloved quarterback who didn't win a whole lot, but at least inspired some hope and fun in the fan base beyond maybe some other players like a Drew Bledsoe who maybe was a better player but wasn't as fun to watch and root for and put your hopes in as Ryan Fitzpatrick was. He played for nine NFL teams. I think one of the more vivid memories uh, of Ryan Fitzpatrick for me uh, was when he was playing with the Jets, needed to beat the Bills in the regular season finale to get the Jets into the playoffs. They come into that game with a 10-5 and record. Um, You know, Chan Gailey as the offensive coordinator. I remember writing up that story about, you know, wouldn't it be, I mean, can't Bills fans root for Ryan Fitzpatrick one more time? You know, wouldn't it be great for these guys to be able to taste the playoffs? And the Bills win that game 22 to 17 with Ryan Fitzpatrick throwing an interception in the end zone at the end of the game. Uh, It looked like the Jets were going to win it. And it was just kind of like uh, such a such a Ryan Fitzpatrick moment, you know, the, the bills win. Uh, and he had that, uh, that chance to, to guide a team to the playoffs for the first time in his career and throws that interception, uh, you know, because that was the thing about Ryan Fitzpatrick as much as, as beloved as he was, he was maddening in, uh, the mistakes that he would make because of his overconfidence, because he believed in his arm, maybe a little bit more than he should have, but that's also part of what made him fun. Um, and the Bills, it's not as though Ryan Fitz, Fitzpatrick held those Bills teams back. That's for sure. I think they thrived and overachieved. I'm thinking back to the, you know, the season when it was nothing but undrafted free agents uh, and late draft uh, and uh, waiver wire acquisitions, Fred Jackson and David Nelson and Stevie Johnson and uh, – you know, did I say Scott Chandler already? Uh, you know, there's just a bunch of guys, Naaman Roosevelt, uh, Donald Jones, and those guys went out and, and they were a lot of fun to watch on a, on a weekly basis, even though the, the Bills were an underdog, probably, you know, 14 games out of the 16. Terrell Owens, his one season in Buffalo, seemed to have a connection with Ryan Fitzpatrick. There was a discovery about Ryan Fitzpatrick while he played in Buffalo, where he was seemed like a backup quarterback, a career backup quarterback before he got here. And then he beat out Trent Edwards and some of the other guys that were here and became a starting caliber borderline starter at some points, but he cemented himself as a better player and a better quarterback than anybody thought he was while he played in Buffalo. Let's uh, talk about Ken Dorsey a little bit, Jonah. He spoke for the first time since he was promoted from quarterbacks coach to offensive coordinator with Buffalo uh, this was Tuesday at uh, the voluntary workout. Uh, and the story that came out of Tuesday in, um, in much of the coverage of Dorsey's words wasn't necessarily what he had to say, but what the players had to say regarding how, what, what a fiery competitor Ken Dorsey is. Uh, Mitch Morris, the Bills center, says that um, the, the Holy Spirit comes out of him sometimes. Um, Gabe Davis talks about how, you know, that the guys, uh, you know, that that we maybe need him up in the press box because he's a little too unhinged or gets a little too crazy. Um, You know, and maybe I'm mixing up my quotes from the different guys. Uh, Mitch Morris definitely was the one who talked about the Holy Spirit. Um, But I don't know. And I also see that fans are very excited about this. You know, they're pumping their fists. It's the type of thing that you want to hear, I guess, as if you're a fan, that this guy's a fiery competitor and, He's a screamer and all this stuff. Um, But I don't necessarily know that I want that out of my, out of my offensive coordinator. Um, You hope that maybe he, you know, has some medications or something, or he stays, goes decaf on game day. I'm not sure what, what, but you know, the ability to calmly pick out a play and and move on to the next without hanging on to the previous one. I, and we're going to find out. Um, But uh, we don't know. We have no idea if Ken Dorsey is going to work out. Uh, and we have no idea whether or not we should be excited or, um, or alarmed that he, uh, that he maybe has a bit of a temper. Yeah, I wouldn't be 
overly concerned about this from a Bills fan standpoint because I think if he was if this was really a problem if his histrionics on the sideline or his ability right to, I think uh, I I find it peculiar that everybody's probably. excited about this yeah, more so like than tough. I think it's maybe a red flag it's just like all right that, that's not necessarily a great thing it seems like something that the players like I don't know if they would have brought this up if it was something they were trying to raise concerns about I do know at all different levels. I do think it's a transition that players need to make from coaching and not have the same demeanor and competitive fire. You can still have the competitive fire, but not express it in the same way. You don't want a coach acting like a player on the sideline for multiple different reasons. You have to make that emotional transition at some point. And Ken Dorsey has been, he hasn't played, I don't think, in a number of years, since 2008. He's been a coach for almost that long since. So I I would say that I don't know if it's a concern, but it's like we don't know what the problems are with a head coach or a new coordinator, especially a first time coordinator until it happens. So if we do see blow ups on the sideline or he's got a really red face and seems to be taking things too hard or too far during games, then maybe we will think back to some of these initial comments and say, you know, that that was something that was a concern raised early on. But it, and then the specifics, it's all about Josh Allen. Does Josh Allen respond well to this kind of coaching? If Josh Allen was a sensitive type that didn't want to get yelled at by his offensive coordinator, then maybe that's an issue. I don't know if that's the case with Josh Allen. I don't know if, if Josh Allen earlier in his career, you would think that you would want his coaches to keep him calm. I don't know if we're past that point now, but I don't know if we need a coach that fires up Josh Allen. He seems like he can do that himself pretty well. Uh, And what I'll say about Josh Allen being fired up and his ability to turn it on and turn it off. And I think it has evolved quite a bit. And where I, I saw it, the snapshot for me is right after the bills scored with 13 seconds left in that game against Kansas city. And the camera shows Josh Allen sitting on the sideline stone faced. He was not excited. He was not congratulating. He was not celebrating. A lot of people on that sideline were, including members of the coaching staff. And I think that, you know, that that's not, I don't want to read too much into it and say, that's why the bills lost that maybe they, that they, that they were diverted from their focus and should have been laser like, but Josh Allen was laser like, and he said it after the game, he said he was concerned because Patrick Mahomes with 13 seconds and all three timeouts, by the way, the chiefs didn't have time to call all three of them because of only 13 seconds, but 13 seconds and two timeouts that they were able to call was was enough and he knew that and so he was in that he was in that moment and i and i i was impressed by that and that wasn't the josh allen that we saw you know throwing the ball over his shoulder against the houston texans in in the playoffs you know this was a a very mature and very um focused i keep using that word uh josh allen on those sidelines so maybe it's the other way around maybe (laughs) josh allen might be calming ken dorsey down Um, but I think that he has such a grasp, uh, of the game right now, and he's coming into his own and the confidence that he feels, um, you know, he's on the precipice of, of greatness. And I'm not talking, he is already a superstar as evidenced by the fact that he was chosen to compete in, in the match, uh, the golf uh, event that was shown on, uh, TNT last night, um, that he and Patrick Mahomes competed against two future Hall of Famers and Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers says something about his star power. Um, but he's on the verge, I think, of cracking through. And, and people were talking about him as a, a Madden cover candidate. And of course, John Madden, because you know the late John Madden after his death, an obvious choice there. But I think Josh Allen, it would have been a legitimate and maybe even a front runner Uh, to be on the cover of of the Madden game. I think he, in many ways, is becoming one of the very few or one of the select faces of the NFL. And he's coming into his own. Anyways, he's not he's not he's not frantic out there. He's not. I mean, it's there are moments he gets it into in the game where he gets where he needs to dial it back, where maybe he's jawn too much with an official or he might take a 15 yard penalty for, you know, doing something like spinning the ball or getting an opponent's face, taunting, whatever. Um but again, but that's, I think that's part of his star power. Some of it's yeah. his playing style and persona and the type of player that he is. He's also has the success in, in the, the great statistics and he is that type of productive football player, but he's also that kind of character as a football player that you could see on the Madden cover or 
uh, you know, doing this, the match golf event. He says the right things. He does the right things. Um, again, it's dangerous to assume that anything, any, any athlete with what they do uh, or, or how they're pictured in the media is how they are in real life. Um, you know, take a look at uh, all the things that everybody used to say about Tiger Woods and his greatness and the fat. And, and then we learned that his, his life off the, off the course was totally unraveling and, uh, this, that, and the other, I mean, we can't, we can't assume anything, but Josh Allen, at least based on what we've seen and, and heard, and, uh, by all accounts, anybody who's been around him, this is a guy who does things the right way. He takes care of his business, both on the field and off. Um, he's one of those guys that you'd be stunned if he ever got himself in some hot water, uh, or made a, made a misstep and ended up in a negative headline. Um, Anyways, he seemed he seems to have it together, and that's I mean, we've kind of gotten off of Ken Dorsey a little bit and, and started throwing our bouquets at, at Josh Allen's feet. But, um, but Ken Dorsey's success is entirely dependent on Josh Allen. Not just right. because he is the quarterback running the offense, but if Josh Allen regresses in any way, Ken Dorsey is going to get the blame for that. In much of the same way that Brian Dable got a lot of credit for developing and allowing Josh Allen to flourish. Yeah, you know, take a look at you know uh, Brian Dable's uh, previous offensive coordinator stops, uh, and he wasn't a genius in Cleveland. He wasn't a genius in Miami. Uh, he he became a genius in Buffalo because he was working with Josh Allen. Um, you know, he didn't have he didn't have a quarterback in Cleveland. He didn't have a quarterback in uh, in Miami. But give him a superstar, and then all of a sudden, wow, this Brian Dable really knows how to call plays. Uh, so, yeah, you're right. It's a, it is a high-pressure situation for Ken Dorsey to be in because if things don't you know, keep pace, uh, which has been pretty Im- remarkable pace uh, that, the, that the Bills have had the past three, four seasons, then, yeah, people are going to be looking askance at Ken Dorsey as to, you know, is he a problem? Does he need to be replaced? Um, and, and that's, I think, where – I don't want to say we're looking too much at the offensive coordinator because that's, it's crucial. There are, there are great quarterbacks who have not had continuity at coordinator. They they've had bad coordinators uh, that it, it, they're going to have to work hand in glove uh, to move this offense down the field. And if, if the chemistry is not there and by all accounts, it seems that there is Josh Allen essentially handpicked Ken Dorsey to be the offensive coordinator. Uh, Both Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott have said time and again that continuity is critical with with Josh Allen and keeping him happy, uh, especially when they've lost so many other parts around him, those voices that they've lost. Um, Even Davis Webb on top of Brian Dable and um, uh, the uh, Shea Tierney, uh, the assistant quarterbacks coach, uh, and Mitchell Trubisky, you know, that that core that those that safety net that was around him that helped him get ready on a weekly basis for the upcoming opponent is all almost all gone. So uh, Ken Dorsey sticking around was, was deemed uh, essential and that chemistry should be there. Um, I think the intrigue lies in, and this scenario might not happen, but it, it certainly could. Whether you get into a situation similar to the last couple of years where Ryan Dable maybe wanted to run a certain style of offense or emphasize certain aspects of the offense, and based on results or what was going on, Sean McDermott was pushing for different style, wanted to establish more of a running game. Brian Dable at times seemed to stand up to Sean McDermott and coach the offense the way his vision directed him to. And will Ken Dorsey as a first year offensive coordinator, uh, you know, have that kind of hammer to be the authority on offense, even if the head coach is pushing him in a slightly different direction. It's a great question. I think the ultimate hammer is with Josh Allen. He's going to swing that hammer. And I think that Josh Allen uh, entering year, what is it, five? Yep. Um, and with what he does and how important he is, he is kind of, uh, he's probably surpassed Sean McDermott in terms of uh, being the most important person in this organization. Uh, and I think that what Josh Allen wants is what Josh Allen's going to get. Now, is Josh Allen clear-minded enough? And with his, um, his experience, is that going to be enough? I mean, does he get wrapped up in the moment uh, 
too much in terms of, you know, game planning. Uh, you, sometimes you need a, a little bit of an outside voice or, or somebody who's, uh, who's not in the huddle uh, to see things in a, in a certain way. Uh, but, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see how much influence Josh Allen has on Ken Dorsey and Sean McDermott. I mean, I don't think that this is a, a circumstance like Marv Levy and Ted Marchabroda just going ahead and giving Jim Kelly the ability to call the plays in the K gun uh, because out of time, really time restraints, they needed to be able to call a play quickly right there at the line of scrimmage. They didn't have time to signal one in if they wanted the, to maximize the K guns uh, effectiveness. So I don't think that we're going to see uh, Josh Allen calling his own plays. Uh, but I think that when that play card uh, is put together for that week's opponent, Josh Allen is going to be, uh, he's going to have the, the most input, uh, even more so than Ken Dorsey. Uh, Jonah, what else do we want to get to today? Um, Outside uh, of the football practices going on this week, there's some somewhat big events, I would say, going on in Buffalo, the Buffalo Bandits in the championship series. It starts at home on Saturday night. The NHL scouting combine starts here in Buffalo this weekend. Sabres have three first round picks. So there's going to be a lot of future Sabres coming in here to prove what they can do. Yeah, it's interesting. Unlike the NFL scouting combine, which is five days of access, you get the coaches, you get the GMs, you get the prospects. Um, the NHL is allowing one day of access, just a few hours on Saturday. So it's not quite the media event that the NFL scouting combine is, of course. Um, but you mentioned the Buffalo Bandits. Um, interesting. And we've, and we've talked about this off the air. Um, I don't know enough about lacrosse to speak intelligently about this matchup. Um, you know, so I'm not going to get into that. But you've raised the point, and I think it is uh, an interesting topic. Similarly to how the Bisons used to be covered in the days of Empire Sports Network and, and the Buffalo News in the day back, you know, I'm talking 20 years ago, 15 years ago even. The bandits used to be covered as fervently as everything but the Bills and Sabres at the Buffalo News. It was covered more than. UB football or big four basketball or high schools, or you name it, anything that Joe Macy, uh, all the different things that you could cover at the Buffalo news. The only things in sports that were bigger would be the bills and Sabres, obviously. And there are times that I think the bandits were covered as, as closely as the Sabres, especially during the Sabres lean years. That doesn't happen anymore. And I'm sure that the, the metrics, determine what the Buffalo news covers. Of course, we don't have the empire sports network period anymore, but what are your thoughts? I mean, we, we both, we both follow this closely. This is right in our wheelhouse. It's local sports. It's what we cover. We both teach sports journalism courses. We're both uh, mentoring younger kids who want to get in this profession. We both worked for the current sports editor at the Buffalo news uh, and previous sports editors and, and how they're, their thoughts may have changed. I guess I'll just leave it at that. I mean, just an open question as to what, what your thoughts are on the, on the fact that the, the bandits and bisons used to be covered every day and now almost nothing. Yeah. And I, I mean, relatively say, speaking, yes, they're, but you know, you're getting a story here, there, but absolutely. they're not going on the road. When you got in the championship game, the Buffalo or the playoffs, the Buffalo news went on the road to cover the bandits. Um, anyways, I'll leave it. I'm, I'm rambling. Well, no, I wouldn't signal out the Buffalo News, even though obviously there's a lot less bandits coverage in the Buffalo News than there were over the years when there was a literal Hall of Fame lacrosse writer, Tom Borelli, covering the team, uh, you know, a decade or so ago when the bandits last won the championship in 2008. But I, I would say there's probably less coverage of this National Lacrosse League in all of the markets than there used to be or some of the markets than there used to be, um, you know, the athletic doesn't cover something like this. I don't think the television stations, I do know there have been stories, but I don't think they're as interested in it. It was Empire Sports Network was around back when the Bandits were more of a relevant franchise in the early 2000s. That could be somewhat of a factor, but it's also from a journalism perspective, sports journalism, there's more homogeneity in the coverage. And this stems from being able to see the readership analytics and thinking, 
we only should write about what the audience is responding to and asking us to write about, but it leads to all of the outlets, big, small, national, and local, focusing more and more attention and resources on NFL, NBA, and major sports, major college sports, and less. We could be have the same conversation about covering high school sports that we're having about covering the bandits and the same conversation about covering various smaller colleges and really all of the colleges locally that we could have about covering the bandits. The Niagara Gazette used to cover the bandits a lot more extensively than they do now. Some of that was because because they had the kill wars and Niagara Wheatfield, Niagara area players on the team that, that aren't on the team now. But for the bandits being the favorites to win the championship and the NLL final start in Buffalo on a Saturday night, there's going to be a party in the plaza. It's an entertaining sport to watch, uh, even if you don't follow the league closely and know everything about what's going on contextually. It's a fun show, especially compared to hockey. There's a lot more scoring and action. I know that the league is considered to be quite healthy. And I, I know this by talking to sports business people or when I'm at, for instance, the NFL owners meetings uh, or I'm around executives in sports in general, the NLL comes up as a, as a, as considered a growth opportunity. You know, people are really looking at the NLL and expansion Um because it's considered a healthy league and yet it's still not getting the coverage that it used to. Yeah. And the bandits are the best team in the league. They're the highest scoring team in the league. They have the best record. This is, it seems like it should be a bigger moment than it is. And maybe I'm missing where it is a bigger moment, but it seems like, especially with off seasons and the other sports, if this was happening in January when the bills were in the playoffs and the Sabres were, playing in their games and I could see why it gets a little bit overlooked but now it seems to me to be like the biggest story in town and I'm not saying certain outlets should cover it more but it feels like the amount of coverage overall and the amount of fan interest and attention should be rivaling at least how many people sat in their chair to watch Ken Dorsey speak live on Wednesday morning or Tuesday morning whenever that was right and especially you know the bandits or the NLL didn't try to do a bubble or empty arenas or anything like that throughout the pandemic. So there was no 2020 season and no 2021 season. And, you know, these, the bandits draw, I, I should look up the numbers and know this exactly, but I think they regularly draw 10, 12,000. And sometimes for playoff games might even get a bigger crowd. There's a dedicated fan base in this area who didn't get to see this team play for two whole years. And now they come back into the best team in the league. It seems like bandit land as they call it. Um, is worthy of a bit more coverage this time of year when all the other sports are in their off season. What do you think would be the difference in terms of local coverage? All right. So maybe this is a, this is a philosophical take more than it is a question, but I'll, I'll ask you the question and I'll tell you what I think, or, and I'm maybe I'll talk it out. Cause I'm not necessarily sure. I know, I, I know yet what I think about it. It's more of a kernel of a thought in my head. If the Buffalo news were covering it, if it were like Tom Borelli or Bud Bailey back in the day and the Buffalo news is covering it now, the way it used to cover the bandits, would everybody else do something? Would it force two, four and seven to do more? Do you think, I don't I think know, that. WGR have the coach on or a couple of players on here or there? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a little bit of a newspaper elitist perspective, but I believe that there's merit to it. I think that television and radio follow the local newspaper, especially the Buffalo News, which I think in a lot of ways, which does a lot of things well. Maybe they did more things well in the past and they do intentionally less these days, but the things they do, I think they do well. And I think that- they, They're not the nearly local, as many people on staff right, right. anymore. But yeah, I think if, if something's being covered aggressively by the Buffalo News, that all of the local media outlets follow that. Sometimes on the radio, it's just reading the Buffalo News story. But it does. And it, I think the fans follow that, too. I mean, we I've talked about this in classes I teach. and I think it probably comes up a lot in your classes. You know, I taught a sports media class in Medi, but there were a lot of athletes, Division three athletes. And they're approaching it from the perspective of if you come out and covered Medi soccer more, we'd have more fans and it would be more important and more coverage. And we're telling them, well, there aren't enough fans and there isn't enough uh, interest and appeal. It's a chicken and an egg type situation. And I think whether it's the bandits, high schools, colleges, the Bisons, any number of things that fall below the bills in the state, all of these contenders for the third franchise, which you're the expert on right. who qualifies for that. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think if, the, if you didn't cover Joe Macy's fights the way you did in the Buffalo News, I think they would have gotten less attention from all of the other media and probably wouldn't have been as big of a local phenomenon if it wasn't for you and your editors at the Buffalo News. And let's and I, I mentioned it earlier, but let, you know that was also at a time of Umpire Sports Network, and I think that that's significant because if you're the Buffalo News and the pride of the that era of working for any newspaper, not just the Buffalo News, but any newspaper in the nineties, well, hell up through say 2010, 2015 was you're supposed to have blanket coverage, blanket coverage. And if the empire sports network had things on its air, we had to keep up and vice versa. And so we made each other better. We covered more, we spent more money because we didn't want to be seen as having something that other outlets did. And I think that that is what kind of raised all all boats in terms of uh, local coverage. But then as it was a different era when newspapers were making much greater profits and when there was a classified section yeah, yeah. that paid uh, paid the bills. Yeah. When you could have more people on your staff. Uh, and there's a reason that there isn't an there isn't an Empire Sports Network anymore or a Bally's regional sports network in Western New York. People have looked into it. It just doesn't the, the cost doesn't add up. The Pagula is even owning three teams, four teams, if you want to count the Amherst, they can, they have the content. They couldn't make it work. They looked at it and it was like, this is ridiculous. It would be, it would be a a total financial suck. Um, But it's, uh, but the Empire Sports Network going away, I think allowed some to relax the Buffalo News included. Um, But I will say this, I I think really the, the number one factor for deciding what's good to be covered is that the money aspect of it, the bang for the buck. And you can actually look at what you couldn't do when you were looking at only newspaper subscribers you would, or your television network ratings for the entire broadcast. You couldn't see which segment of your sportscast was doing a certain number. It was a, a, a one thing. It was your half hour or your hour or whatever your show was. Um, And then in the newspaper, it was just how many subscribers do you have? And you couldn't tell unless you did a survey, which is a a kind of guessing, uh, who was subscribing for what reason. And even if it was the sports section, you you can't tell which eyeballs were skipping over the Bison story or the Bandit story or the, the Bills or the Joe Macy story or the high school's coverage. You couldn't tell. So you covered it all. Well, in today's digital world, you can see exactly who is reading, um, how many of them are reading, uh, how long they are reading. If they're just glancing at it for 10 seconds or they're spending five minutes, you can see exactly how long somebody is staying on a page and how far they're getting. You can you know, use a, some sort of algorithm to find out how far they're getting into the story. Um, and so high schools and the Bisons and the, the bandits just don't return the numbers and you're paying, yeah. you pay in, at, the, at the Buffalo News, a, a guild newspaper, you're pretty much paying your bills reporter the same that you're paying your college reporter. So why, you know, why do we keep Mark gone? I'm speaking, maybe I'm not speaking out of school, I don't think, but Mark gone used to cover colleges. He doesn't anymore. He's back on the bills, even though he was a great colleges reporter for the Buffalo News, he's back on the bills beat. And it's because he, he wasn't it was kind of a waste of an asset. Um, I will say this, and then I'll turn it back over to you, Jonah, is the, the stories that do the worst for me at the athletic are UB football stories. And I can write about any number of things. Um, and it seems like whatever I write about UB football, nobody cares. And one of the worst performing stories I did was about Jarrett Patterson as a, you know, as a great player, one of the greatest in UB history, it was even retweeted by Jarrett Patterson himself, and nobody read it. He, even people who follow Jarrett Patterson on Twitter, assuming his family, whatever, nobody read the story. And uh, I put as much time into that story as I would any. Um, so when it comes time to figuring out what we're going to cover next, we think twice, or at least I'll just say I do. I have a lot of pull as to what I write about, but my editor and I will think twice before we say, let's do a UB football story. Yeah, well, journalistically, sports is a little bit different than news and other city side beats 
because it is a bit more like entertainment coverage. And in that sense, audience and eyeballs maybe matter a little bit more in determining what should be covered and you know where the emphasis should lie. But outside of sports, the stories that are the most read and get the most clicks aren't always the most important stories to do. And there's a lot of That's right. local coverage, even national coverage and politics and things like that and local school boards that should be covered, even if it's not going to get the same traction digitally. There's a journalistic responsibility and even a community responsibility to cover these things and to ferret out the interesting stories. Because a lot of times in or out of sports, you can find a good story on a small beat. Somebody might not be that interested in UB football, but if you find the right way to tell a UB story um, that can be interesting, maybe it doesn't get huge metrics, but it, I think it would get appreciation from the people that do read the story. And I think there's some, even in sports, I think there's some responsibility to find the stories and the relevant topics in amateur sports and local outlets and high schools and colleges, especially when you're talking about the people that live here and their families live here and they're from here and being able to tell those stories. And I don't really criticize any specific news outlet for how they handle their business, but the totality of all of the news outlets going in the same direction and following each other, there should be something in the ecosystem. You know, if two, four and seven and the big daily newspaper and everybody is not covering the bandits, there should be a different outlet that gives the people that want that coverage, that kind of coverage and finds the good stories and maybe that encourages other outlets to follow them it just shouldn't be no more of this coverage of anything that falls below this line of demarcation where there's only two or three four major sports that matter yeah you're right and and the more homogenous to use your word the more homogenous the local sports scene gets the less productive it is for me, at least this is my strategy, is to cover those things. I generally do not cover anything that is said at a news conference because everybody has it. My job is to create unique content for the athletic, to give readers something they can't get anywhere else. And so I was at Ken Dorsey's news conference on Tuesday. I didn't write a word off of it because it's being aired live on WGR. Uh, the video is all over the place. People can watch it themselves. They don't need me to tell them. Uh, you've heard it, you've read it, you've seen it, and for free. If I expect you to pay for a subscription to The Athletic, I have to give you something above and beyond that. So generally, but yeah, it's it's interesting. Uh, but there's, there is a mentality that because it's said at a news conference, at a lectern, um, on a podium, uh, that we have to we have to put this on our air. We have to put this in the paper. We have to cover this. We have to chronicle this. Um, and it does become, you know, kind of a, uh, you know, uh, I guess it's not a self fulfilling prophecy isn't the isn't the right phrase I'm looking for. But uh, it, you it's kind pack, of are pack journalism. You're pack, you're, yeah, you're pack journalism, right. and you marginalize your 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 effectiveness. You yeah. you limit yourself. By covering those things. And that's a pejorative when you talk about maybe political or news or local government coverage or things like that. But in sports, it seems to be best practice, tech journalism in a lot of ways. But I don't know. I mean, you read those best American sports books. I got those all, every volume lined up on that top shelf over there. And most of the stories are on offbeat, either minor sports or you know, deep sea rock diving, climbing, things, yeah, things like that. And so a lot of times the best stories and the most unique stories come in off the beat. You know, it's hard to get, you, you do a good job of this, but I think it's very hard to get a unique and compelling NFL story that somebody else isn't already writing, but it's a lot easier to do that on a national lacrosse league team, or especially covering your local area, high school, you know, homegrown athletes, things like that, you can be the first and the only to tell a compelling story that you don't get, you don't have to worry about national outlets or ESPN coming in and doing the same story that you do and getting a bigger audience because they already have a bigger built-in audience. Sorry, I was distracted a little bit there. Our good friend, Mike Rodak sent me a text and you never know what you're gonna get when you see an alert from Mike Rodak on your Twitter or I'm sorry, on, on your text. 
Well, Rodak would be a fun person to talk to about this because he covered the Bills and only the Bills here and was very elitist, I think, about it. He didn't think anything below the Bills was worth covering. Now he's down in Birmingham, Alabama, covering a much wider variety right. of Alabama sports. Well, he just sent me uh, a text. His text is uh, sends me to Twitter. That's why I keep flipping the terms back and forth. Alabama men's basketball on Twitter. Uh, just sent out a note in honor of the 10 victims who lost their lives in last month's top supermarket attack. Buffalo native Dom Welch will wear number 10 for the upcoming season. Um, hashtag Buffalo 10. Pretty cool gesture, I think. Nice gesture from Dominic Welch. Yeah. And there's also Brian Hodgson on that staff who's from Jamestown, New York, and obviously NATO's coached here in Buffalo Connections. Uh, Jonah, let's wrap it up. Uh, I, that was a good talk. I liked uh, I liked the journalism side of that and uh, maybe gives a little insight. We've talked about it before, but it does give a little insight as to how stories get picked, who covers what. Um, well, let me make one more quick reference of a story that I think might be getting a little bit undercovered. Sure. Maybe it's being covered and I'm just not seeing it uh, because of the Twitter algorithm. But Kanisha's baseball just won the Mac for the first time. Actually, it's only been the first time in four years for them, but it's the first time in Mac history that uh, a Mac school has the baseball and softball tournament champion going on to the NCAA tournament. Um, softball already played a couple weeks ago at Florida. Baseball is going to play Miami, the number six overall seed in the tournament tomorrow. And they're also in the regional, double elimination regional with Arizona and Ole Miss. So if you're a baseball fan or some people seem to only get interested in local college sports when they're playing against big teams on the big stage, that's happening this weekend for Kanisha's baseball and a nice feather in the cap for the Golden Griffins being the first to pull this double play in Mac baseball and softball. Hopefully a chance to see them. I'm not sure what the broadcast situation's like, but hopefully uh, they'll be on the air somewhere. I guess I should have looked that up, uh, but these it games is. generally are on. I, I think it's on ESPN plus, but it might be. I think the further you go in the turn, yeah, ESPN plus. So if you have that service, you can get it. You, you probably go through the Canisius website to sign up or find your way to watch it. But yeah, I do. They might have to get to the super regionals round before they actually show up on TV. I know you want to go, but I wanted to ask your take on something else. Yeah. You're busy. Well, so Canisius is playing in the NCAA tournament regional. If they move on, they'll be playing in the college world series. The women's college world series is going on. The if you go division one, division two, II, division three, then junior college, division one, II, division two, II, division three, and AIA, all the different levels, everything's a world series. Uh, how do you feel about that? How about the world series of poker? Yeah, well, well, my take is that none of these are world series, and even major league baseball is not a world series, but maybe you could argue that the world series of poker is because it's the American League against the National League, there's no other countries involved. So why are we calling it the World Series? And uh, that was probably came up with more than 120 years ago. But these days, especially when you're talking about Division Three junior college playing each other, they're all community colleges within the United States. This isn't the World Series. None of this is the World Series. Yeah, I think it's American exceptionalism, right? It's the winner uh, in your World Series uh, is the is the world champion. Uh, in baseball, that's probably the case. But how about the Little League World Series, where America is guaranteed a spot in the in the in the championship game, no matter what? But they bring in, uh, you know, there's teams from other countries in the Little right. League World Series. But so there's I like, would... right? But you're if America's guaranteed one of the slots, how are you sure that that's the true champion? Shouldn't the to be the two best teams? Well, how do we know that the? Well, now I'm drawing a blank on who won the World Series, but how do we know that the? Houston Astros are the best team in the world if they're That's only right. playing against teams that are in the same country as them. I agree. But how we've about, had this conversation with Elite Eight and Sweet 16 and Final Four and how that can be extended to any tournament in any sport at any point in time. And, and I'm a little more selective about there's the World Series, there's the Final Four, there's the Sweet 16, and everything else is final, quarterfinal, semifinal, sub-regional. What about uh, Prince and Sheena Easton, uh, man versus woman in the World Series of Love? <laughs> from you got from you got the look. That's the lyric. It's that's like the breakdown, uh, the bridge. You know, man versus woman in the World Series of Love. You don't remember that song? You're a big Prince guy. I don't. Well, I don't know. check it out. 
Herkimer Community College won the Division Three Junior College World Series. They're the first team from New York to ever do that. Well, they, they're going to go on to play a Division Three team in Chinese Taipei, maybe, <laughs> or, or Aruba or something, <laughs> to find out who's, uh, who's really the World Series champion. Jonah, always great talking with you. Thanks for carving out some time. And uh, we'll do this again next week with your permission. Sure. I'll be here. Thanks, everybody, for listening to Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. CTBK is more than just a full-service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem-solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara community through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2020 and 2021 to keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400 and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you.